today I want to talk about, is it my favorite chord? Probably. And this is this thing. Which is, ah, what is it? Well, let's have a look. It is, in this case, simply a D major shape with a C in the bass. This is not out there stuff, you know, you will have played this if you've played any rock guitar or anything. That kind of thing, right? So this is um, actually a pretty common place shape, but it's one of the most intriguing chords because it kind of is a little bit functional and it's a little bit colourful. It's kind of the two. So from a functional point of view, this is actually a D7 chord with a C in the bass. And the C is of course the seventh, right? Um, a whole step below the root, so open and shut case, right? It's just a D7 chord. Well, it doesn't sound anything like this. It's got a very different character. And that is, I think, down to the fact that it's got that very clear triad in there that's kind of floating above the root. And then think about that, then it becomes a sort of Lydian chord. So if we just take it from that C, we've got a sixth, we've got a ninth or a second, we've got a sharp eleventh or sharp fourth. So think of it as a kind of major sharp eleventh chord and or in the case of classical figured bass, they would have called it a six sharp four two, or a sharp four two for short, because they'd specify each of the intervals within it. Um, and it could be often used as a chromatic chord, so that is a chord that doesn't belong to the key. So let's think about some ways in which this chord has been used in the repertoire. And I'll start with some classical stuff. Um, here's a, a, a simple type of harmonization known as a rule of the octave, and I'm just gonna play it in G. Descending from a G chord, then we play a, an inversion of uh, D major, an inversion of A7, A7 over E, so ba, ba, boom, and then we get to D, which is reposition D, boom, boom, ba, oh, ba, and then we go that D slash C into G over B. And now this is, uh, it's functionally the same as that, but it does not sound the same, which is why functional harmony is questionable okay because it has that beautiful and the thing going on for one of a better word this is the sort of harmonization that you would learn if you were learning how to realize partimento um, uh, that's a technically it's a first position ro or rule of the octave regole dell'ottava okay so um, that's fine, you might say, I don't really care about 18th century music. Well, you know, it crops up. Um, here it is in a popular Stevie Wonder song. You are the sunshine of my life. So um, we've introduced two new shapes here. This is, um, this is the chord in C on the fifth degree uh, if you're thinking about the root or the fourth degree if you're thinking about the bass. So this is G over F. That's the G. That's the F. Even easier to see at the open strings. G chord. F in the bass. Okay. And then resolving here I think to an E minor 7. So it's kind of resolves down a half step. Did the same thing in the RO. half step okay so pretty huh um, it doesn't sound like a dominant chord if it was just like but this kind of has this floating Lydian quality in a Stevie Wonder example too so you remember the B section of James I talked about a couple of videos ago and then we get the F sharp. So that's how it's used sort of diatonically within the key. Uh, there is obviously a Lydian mode to be found in the fourth degree of every major chord. I just want to give you an idea of how it might sound in a minor context because it's so beautiful. Here's a G minor. Uh, let's do a D minor. Sending a D minor natural minor scale bass. Boom, 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 bass. Um, I'll do a few more minor, try and remember to do some minor examples. The minor examples are very nice. 
Okay, so uh, now another way we can use it is as a substitute for the one seven chord going to four. Now in practice, this means you put the the chord from the the bass up on the flat seven. And my favorite example of that is Aguas de Marçal by Tony Carlos Jobim, produced for the Portuguese. Um, where he plays the intro is this. <laughs> This is voted the greatest Brazilian song of all time, I believe, in the poll. Um, you can hear that it really wants to go Lydian, doesn't it? At that point, you think, oh, I'm a B-flat Lydian. But no, the, the key centre of the song is in fact C major, C Ionian. Um, so it has this interesting coloristic effect. Functionally, it's just doing this. It doesn't sound like that. <laughs> it sounds like this. completely different emotion attached to that chord progression, I think, even though functionally it's the same. I think I dislike functional harmony almost as much as I dislike chord scale theory. You might be asking, what does that leave? What does that leave? Counterpoint, that's what it leaves. Anyway, so I'm just going to give some lovely examples um, of the usage of this chord on the one. Um, and the first one I'd like to do is actually just how you can use it on a, on a descending scale bass. So the example we had here. For example, it's just one way of harmonizing that bass. Another way you could do it is this. And you can carry on going. Let's put another like you know, another little uh, third inversion chord in there as well. So what's going on here is we've got G major. So I'm just using G, A slash G, D slash F sharp, you know, a bit like the Matheny, but in a different different context. And then third inversion, G7 chord with F sharp in the bass. Maybe an E minor, or you could do, um, uh, I think in that example, A7 with an E in the bass also works. So this is beautiful because it kind of opens up this kind of gorgeous sort of Lydian realm again. Uh, if you listen to uh, a Passagalia by Silvius Leopold Weiss, which I can't play, but the first chords are this. And so on, right? So it's just beautiful. That, well, that wasn't a very broad chord, that one. It's a bit, a bit too uh, 1980s. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, check that piece out. It's gorgeous. I like the um, Julian Bream version. Of course, it was originally written for lute. You know, and I, I can't really play it, but it's an example from the Bach uh, well-tempered clavier, clavier, <laughs> have you say it, um, book one uh, prelude. It just basically does this. It goes... And then... similar thing so each time we're moving down a half step usually to a first inversion chord of some kind Joni Mitchell uses this chord beautifully in a song called Just Like This Train uh, let me see if I can remember how to sing the melody always running behind the times just like this train and she actually goes to a root position G there but you can easily just like this train do the same thing there. Again, it keys into that Lydian lift behind the chord, particularly in this version, this inversion where, unlike the Bach example and the Vice example, we actually have the, uh, depending how you look at it, either the third or the sharp fourth or sharp eleventh of the chord on top. So really melodically prominent. So just like this dream. It does resolve in the way that one would expect. You know, it goes up a semitone up to the root and resolves. But it kind of has that aching 
Just like this train. That dreamy sort of Lydian lift to it, which is really gorgeous, actually. And of course, because we were originally starting off in C major, it sounds like the Lydian mode anyway. Um, one of my favorite examples is from Gabriel Fauré, a wonderful composer, um, sort of generation before Debussy and Ravel at the um, Paris Conservatoire. And uh, he plays with this idea. <laughs> simplify the harmony but it's basically what it is is um, F major our friend G over F and then um, it goes to not the expected C over E but in fact in an F7 sharp 11th which in this context would probably be thought of as an augmented sixth a French sixth chord going to E and then E7 and then it's interesting because he's taking these 18th century tropes and playing with them. Somebody like Faure knew this stuff better than anybody, like counterpoint harmony. It was the foundations on which the Paris Conservatoire was built and where all these people like Faure, uh, um, Debussy, Ravel, Nadia Boulanger, they all came from this context of understanding this kind of stuff intuitively. That that's studying it when they were like 11. <laughs> so um, uh, it's kind of Faure's playing with us and of course the lyrics are Lydia, um, yeah, a bit on the nose, but you know, <laughs> it was the 19th century. Um, I want to show you how it sounds in minor as well, as I love it in minor. So let's do D minor again, the key of death. <laughs> twice. One of my favourites is to go, uh, here's, here's an example from a apartment I'm doing, so we start off in A minor, F major over A minor, this is another voicing of the same chord, oh, how gothic is that? And then we go to the um, to that. So this, this is um, A Voicing a close voice this time of uh, B over A, which is a dominant going to uh, E minor, but an E minor with a G in the bass. We could do it like this. lower bass sounds fantastic doesn't it um interestingly like there's a big gap between the 19th century Gabriel Faure into the 70s Joni Mitchell Pat Metheny maybe 60s um Jobim um a big sort of jazz shaped hole which is interesting because I think often in straight head jazz we tend to think of all the chords being in root position this kind of stuff you know I associate these chords as being more to do with either the 18th century or common practice era or to do with the sort of 70s postmodal fusiony singer songwriter sort of era you know I mean Joni Mitchell's a very fusiony songwriter what can you say it's actually quite interesting like you don't really come across this this much I mean you do come across it you know as a sort of passing chord like in a traditional jazz harmonization of like uh, you know a, a sort of going to four turn around which is fine but in that context it's kind of functioning purely as a passing chord it doesn't really have that that Lydian-ness and I find that quite interesting um, maybe there's something like counter examples that you could mention. Um, so for instance, if, if we're using in the 251, a good example of that is the Bridge of Wave, where we play this. If you look at the old real book, it was this. G minor seven, C seven, F major seventh, F minor seventh, B flat seven, E flat major seventh, right? 251, F, 251 and E flat. What um, 
Jobim actually had was this. Okay, so what is that? Well, that's um, a first inversion, G minor seventh. Third inversion, uh, C7. F major seventh in first inversion. So the A in the bass, mode change to F minor over the A flat, first inversion F minor 7th, and then third inversion B flat 7th, first inversion E flat major, and then we've got that sort of uh, 7 flat 9 chord there. Um, absolutely dreamy again, like beautiful use. Um, and lastly I want to talk about you know how we can use it to spruce up like dominant chain, so there's a dominant chain in yesterday's, it kind of, you know. Um, so we've got that nice sort of dominant chain going around, uh, starts on the sort of 2-5, E7, A7, D7, G7, C7, F7, B flat major 7th, and then there's like a 5-1 into D minor. And this is uh, obviously, um, you know, kind of quite an old school chord progression. So we can 70s it up a bit, or even 18th century up a bit, 18th century it up a bit by using um, this third inversion chord. And, and as I mentioned in the last video, uh, for a back cycling chord progression, you can go first, third, first, third, first, third, or third, first, third, first, third, first, go back between the two inversions. So we're going to do that. We'll start with the. Um, what should we do? Oh, uh, let's start with the third inversion, um, E7 first. That's uh, an A7, D7, G7, and that's a. Uh, sorry, my brain's gone. C7, F7, and it's B flat major seventh, right? So if you want to prepare it a bit more, you could use um, just first inversion triads and then turn them into dominants. So this might sound nice. So a little bit Chopin-ish maybe. It's a very good way to change key fast, you know. It also it also gives you a, a chromatic bass. Which is kind of cool. And if you know yesterday's, you'll know there's a chromatic bit where it goes and after Okay, uh, sorry, it's not necessary to do that, but I've you know I've had a long day. Um, so you could use that as a harmonization for the bass line. So let's take a nice fruity. Oh, let's, 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 let's be classical and use a straight minor. And we're going to go first inversion, third inversion, first inversion. How hip is that? So basically what I just did is a D minor, um, A over C sharp. Uh, what happens now? I can't remember. <laughs> Um, jazz guitar teacher has gone wrong and can't remember what chords he was playing. Two, five, four. This count the dominance. Why not a third inversion B flat major seventh? Why not? Why ever not? Why not indeed? And then I really miss having a low D. I need a seven string guitar, clearly. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, that's how you can use third inversion dominant chords to inject a bit of interest into your otherwise stupid lives. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know any questions or points you might have.